you have your Bibles, you can turn to the, big, the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to take a moment to get there, but uh, we will eventually get there this morning. And uh, we saw a video talking about light, and um, uh, we're going we're to look at that this morning and see, see what he's talking about with some lies by my parents. Uh, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, I was told uh, some lies by my parents and other people in, in, um, in the culture. I don't know if you did the same thing, but let me give you some of these, and you can tell me whether they are true or not, or whether they're actually lies or whether they're truths or not for your life. First of all, this, here's the first one. You need to put some, you have a scrape, you have a cut on, on your hand or somewhere, and they tell you this, you need to put some hydrogen peroxide on that, right? And the point behind it is that the hydrogen peroxide is going to bubble and, and get all the bad stuff out. Is that a truth or a lie? New medical research actually says that it is a lie because the, the hydrogen peroxide can cause damage at a cellular level, actually increasing the time of healing for the cells that have been damaged. And so you can thank your mom that one, and when she's in a nursing home, you know what to do, pour hydrogen peroxide all over those cuts. <laughs> that is terrible, isn't it? I remember my mom, but every time I would, when I was riding my bicycle, she'd pour that stuff on those cuts, and you're like, this is so painful. And now I'm thinking about this made it even worse. I'm going to wait one day. All right, here's another one. Right, who, who cracks their knuckles? Who pops their knuckles? All right, have, a, have about a handful in here. The other handful in here are like appalled that anybody would do it, right? Like you don't do it because your mom said, if you crack your knuckles, it's going to give you what? Arthritis, right? Right? All right. So, um, anybody cracking knuckles? You got any arthritis making it even worse for any of you yet? I don't know. Maybe some of you later on in, in your life, you've, you've been through some of these things and maybe doing some of it. Actually, this is a lie uh, also. Uh, cracking your knuckles does not give you arthritis. Uh, actually, what happens when you crack your knuckles, it's gases, nitrogen that is, that contain, that's contained within your fingers. And when you crack your knuckles, it actually displaces the gas and, and it causes a popping sound. There's a, a doctor named Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Unger who done this. He done a study uh, for 60 years. He cracked his knuckles on the left side of his hand, the right side, and he never did. And after 60 years, they did this big medical study, and there was no difference in his hand. And so in honor of cracking your knuckles, I want us all to do this together, all right? Now, some of you, when you do this, or if you do do it, like, you're going to, it's like going to flip you out, because this is a no-no. Like, you've set this up, like, if you crack your knuckles, then God don't love you anymore. But this morning, I want to tell you, it is for freedom that God has set you free. So this morning, you can crack your knuckles. So on the count of three, everybody crack your knuckles. One, two, three. Hey. That's awesome, man. That sound never gets old. That's awesome. That is awesome. All right, here's another one. Don't swallow your gum because it'll take how many years? Seven years to pass through your digestive system. This is actually a lie as well. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, I was told that, and I had this, you know, this great fear that this stuff's like in me for like ever, right? Like it's, it's not even going to be seven years, it's going to last forever, but um, it, it does happen and follows through on the digestive process. You know how that, that works, so we won't get into that, but um, that, is, that is not true. All right, here's another cool one. Uh, don't go outside with, a, with wet hair or you will catch a cold, right? Truth or a lie? That's a lie, right? But we live our lives by it every day, right? Like we won't go outside with, with a, uh, uh, our hair wet or we're going to catch a cold. Like all of a sudden our nose just starts running. I don't know. That makes no sense at all to me, but uh, we do it. All right, here's the last one. Cats can steal the air from a baby's mouth. You heard of that one? Never leave a cat with a sleeping baby because that cat will get up there and as evil as they are, they're going to suck the air out of that baby, right? <laughs> That's right. That's what we think. Like, don't leave that cat. We're going to lock the cat in the other room because the baby's in here sleeping. Um, think about that. That isn't it's just anatomically not even, there's no way that a, a cat can like suffocate a baby and like hold its nose at the same time and like try to kill the thing. And so, uh, so there, there's no fear. That actually goes back to the medieval times when they thought cats were as evil as they actually are. Um, they, um, if cats could hold weapons, it would be a dangerous place that we live in. They are uh, crazy. You know, there are certain things throughout our lives we've accepted 
Uh, maybe the culture's reinforced it, or maybe it's a, we use this term, an old wives tale, and, and uh, uh, we, we hear these things, and we live our lives by them sometimes. Sometimes they're silly, like, like don't go outside with, the, with, with wet hair, you're going to catch a cold, and, and we do those things. But sometimes things that we accept in our lives because culture either says it, or it's just being a commonly held belief that, that if you do that, sometimes those things have dire circumstances or, or it can cause uh, problems in our lives. We see Jesus did this same thing when, when he was alive. There were certain things that they accepted, especially in the church at the time, that, that he dealt with. And so we hear him saying all the time where they would have certain religious beliefs or thoughts that they would go through. And Jesus would say certain things like this. You've heard it said, but I tell you. And so he's debunking some of the myths that these people have had their whole lives. And they've held on to these certain things. And, and I don't know if, if you would believe it here this morning, but uh, during the time, the, the religious people had created an environment where certain people weren't invited or felt welcome inside of the religious establishment. They wouldn't fit in with the rest of the people who had it all together, who looked good and dressed right and, and knew all the stuff about God. They created certain things about the way you dressed. And if you dressed a certain way, then, then there's no way that you could even get to God. If you looked a certain way or you looked apart or you had uh, certain things on you, then there was no way you were ever going to get to God. I know that's hard to believe in our culture that people would do that, but they would also be upset about the way people worshipped. Expressive worship to them made them very uncomfortable and put them at, uh, made them uneasy. And so they would look at certain situations and they would cast glances and, and eyes at them. No, they wouldn't say a word with their mouth. Their eyes said everything about what they thought about this situation. They looked at people who didn't have it all together. Maybe those people, they would be considered sinners and, and they would look at them and they would put a hand out and say, this is as far as you could ever come to God because of the way your situation is right now and what you're dealing with right now, you cannot make it to Him. Maybe they had struggles in their life. Maybe they didn't look the part. Maybe they didn't act the part. I mean, they, they looked at them and they, they accepted it. Religious people accepted that this is, this is what God wants. And so we see Jesus all the time. He's dealing with these certain things. And, and I think what Jesus is trying to say in, in each and every one of these situations where He says, well, th that, that may be true or maybe partially true, but I tell you this, He's looking at these things and going, this is false. It's, it's only a half truth, but this isn't fully the heart of God. This isn't what He fully wants out of your life. It's, it's a false belief. And I want you to look at human beings through my eyes. I want you for a second to take off everything that you've thought about me or even the word that you think you know about me, even though you know a lot. I want you to take that off for a second. I want you to look at humanity through my own eyes. I want you to see people the way that I see them. I want you to see the people the way that I saw them before they were ever created and I put eyes in their head. I formed them and I placed them on this earth with a purpose and a plan for their life. I want you to see them that way. Don't see them on the, on the outside. Don't look at them as, as man looks at them, as the, as, as the appearance, but look at them as the, God, the way that God looks at them. Look at them the way that, that God sent the prophet to go find the new king, and they went to David's brothers in the whole situation, and, and they went through all the brothers, and finally there was no one left. And, and the prophet says, is there anyone else here? And there's David out in the field, and God said, man looks on the outside, but God looks at the heart, Right? And it goes on, and um, there's a story I want to look at. You don't have to turn in there. It's found in Luke chapter 7. Last weekend, I had the opportunity to go to Haiti and, and see Keaton uh, Schilling's one of our, our missionaries, short-term missionaries that is there, and he's doing an awesome job. And you guys would be so proud of him as one of our own that we've sent out. And we had the opportunity to go, and his mom and dad and a couple others to go uh, just encourage him and to do mission work while we were there. And uh, one night we were laying in bed. If you have ever been there before, you realize that um, the first five minutes that you're there, it's extremely hot. And um, it's extremely hot when you go to bed. And so um, we have these battery-powered fans that blow on us because there's uh, very little electricity. And so I'm, I'm laying in my bed, and I'm just taking my shower because that's the best thing to do because you're wet. And I'm afraid I'm going to catch a cold. Uh, but I'm praying in God's will that I don't. And so I get in the bed, and I turn this battery-powered fan on me, and I'm, I'm, I'm reading my Bible. And I read this story in Luke chapter 7. And by this point, I've already got a good back sweat going on. You know, just you're wet. And so um, I'm sitting there, and um, I'm reading this story, and it just captivated me. 
I just, it just, it got me. And I, I, I read it and I, I re- reread it and I reread it and I fin- tried to go to sleep and I couldn't sleep. And the chickens start crowing by about 3.30 in the morning, which they got their time clock all messed up. And, and I woke up and I'm thinking about this story. And there's a Pharisee, his name is Simon. He's a religious leader of the day. Um, he's got everything going on. He's leading people in the temple. He's, he's uh, serving God. He's uh, holding fast to the truths of Scripture. Uh, he knows the Word of God. And Jesus, as the traveling rabbi who's coming into town, it is Simon's job in that moment to, um, um, it's kind of a cultural thing, to invite him over for dinner, to have him in, to show him hospitality. So Simon invites him in. Um, hospitality would tell him that the uh, best thing for him to do or what he should do is provide oil to anoint his head, um, to uh, give him water, at, at least to give him water for his feet, to wash his feet. If you've ever been to a third world country with us, you know walking around dirty streets, your feet get extremely dirty. And so it's a cultural thing to wash someone's feet or at least give them a water basin so they could wash their own feet. And then the other uh, kind of cultural hospitality thing is to greet someone. The modern day equivalent of today is to shake someone's hand. But in that day, it would not either to kiss them on the hand or to kiss them on the cheek. It was just a common thing. And, and Jesus comes in. Simon doesn't do any of those things. And so they begin to have a meal. And the Bible says that Jesus is reclined at the table. And it would have been a low table. Uh, maybe 18 inches tall, and they would have pillows they would lean back against. And so uh, dinner time was a very intimate time. It was meant to uh, last hours, and they would talk, and they would recline, and they would speak, and it would be the equivalent of moving your couch up to your dinner table and just hanging out for hours there. So Jesus and the Pharisee, and and I'm not sure who else is in the story here, but they're there, they're having this, this conversation, and things got weird real quick. Things just got real uh, uh, uneasy for everyone who was involved real quick. The Bible says a woman who was a sinner, later on we find out she's a prostitute, she walks in to this situation. And place yourself there for me. I want you to go there with me because you've got to see this. You've got to see the intensity of this moment and the beauty of this moment right here and, and, and what happens in this whole situation. This woman walks in, unwelcomed, unannounced, um, not prepared for, And the Bible says that she comes over to Jesus. Now, Jesus would have been reclined, his feet underneath the table. He's leaning back. So this wouldn't have been been something easy for for this to happen. Jesus would have had to spun himself out from this table. And the Bible says she is broken and weeping, and she falls at his feet. Now, most likely, she wouldn't have known that Simon didn't wash his feet. So as she's there on her knees, on her face before him, her tears are falling. She begins to notice mud streaks come down his feet, down his legs. Something happens inside of her and she realizes that Simon the Pharisee hasn't done what he's supposed to do. And so she begins to wash his feet with her own tears. First, she's doing it. Her tears are falling. There's so many tears. I don't know if you've ever cried tears like this before, but they can amount to a lot sometimes. And so she begins to wash with her hands and begins to stroke his feet and get all the mud off his feet. And she realizes she doesn't have a towel because this wasn't something that was prepared for. And so she lets down the hair off of her head and begins to wash and dry his feet. Can you imagine that scene? It'd been something to be, if she was forced to do that, would be something to be very humiliating for a woman. But she was willing to humiliate herself because of something maybe Jesus had said earlier in the day. Maybe she was sitting outside and heard Jesus talk and it just pierced her heart. And so she thought, this is the moment. I'm going to take the moment right now and I'm going to take this, seize this opportunity and follow my face before Jesus. So she comes down. Everyone there would have been just repulsed they would have been extremely uneasy, very uncomfortable, very uh, um, um, just sickened maybe because you see it in Simon, he says this to himself, inside of himself. He said, if this was a rabbi, he should have known what kind of woman is touching him. This is a dirty, filthy human being. She has no business touching him. Jesus knows what is going on in Simon's heart, speaks to Simon while looking at this woman. 
and says, uh, it gives him a parable and says there's a man or two men that owe debts and these debts were forgiven. One was ex- really big and one was really small, but both of them were forgiven. He asked Simon, says, who's going to be more grateful because their, their debt has been forgiven? And Simon responds, says, well, I think the one with the greatest amount of debt. And so he turns to the woman and says, you are right. And in an instant, he looks at Simon and at this woman. He rebukes the Pharisee, but looks at the woman and says, I forgive you of all your sin. Go in peace. Your sins are forgiven. Your sins have made you whole. He looks at the man and the one who's got it all together, the one who has a life all figured out, the one who's got God figured out and got him in his quarter and knows everything about him and looks at the man and says, you are rebuked. But in this situation, this is the woman that's receiving life. There's an attitude difference between these two people. She's willing to humiliate herself in front of me because she has been, she's tasted the grace and the, 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 the knowledge of Jesus Christ. But you, my friend, you have never tasted that. So I want you to sit right there and, and, and look and see what's happening to this woman. She has received salvation. And the other people still haven't got it figured out. Yeah, look at Jesus and they're thinking inside themselves, who is this man that can forgive people of their sins? Only God can do that. There's something that happens there in this situation. The Bible says God opposes the the proud but gives grace to the humble. And can I tell you this morning, there is no way to wholeness but through brokenness. And I don't know what you come in wearing this morning. You may look good. You may smell good. You may think good things about yourself. Can I tell you something? You are a broken human being this morning. I don't care what you have. I don't care what kind of money's in your bank account or how much you know about the Bible. You are a broken human being. And that is the only way that God will ever accept you before Him. Because He says, you come to me any other way, I'm going to oppose you. I'm going to fight you. And I don't want to be on that side of the books. Simon is a man of the Pharisee. Has it grown up as a Jew? By the age of 12, he would have known the first five books of Scripture. He would have known over 300 prophecies of the, in the Old Testament about the Messiah to come. He would have known 612 uh, law, 613 laws that are given in the Old Testament, how to live a life that is honorable and pleasing to God. And he, he tried to do that every day. He would have known there were 365 of those that were, that were negative, of things of saying, don't do this. And he would have known there were 248 that were positive, saying these are the things that you should do. But Simon, being the man who was as close to God as he was, did not even have a clue he was broken. I asked you this question here this morning. In this situation, who would you rather be? Who would you rather be? I think most of us would probably um, um, want to answer that both ways. I want to have the appearance that I've got it all together. I want to have the appearance that my life is good and there's no struggles and no problems and, and me and God, we've we, we're, we're, we got it all together, man. But on a, on a spiritual side, I want to have, have the idea that I'm broken before God because I know that's the only way that I can ever receive His grace and mercy. And if God were to ask you this morning, who are you? Where would you find yourself at? Would you find the, the Pharisee? Even though he was as close as he was and knew what he should have done, he had the Son of God sitting in front of him and didn't have a clue and didn't even show him the minor hospitality that he should have. Would you be the woman broken your sins before the creator of your soul pouring it out? There's a man in, in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He's writing to these Corinthian people. These Corinthian people were, um, um, they were the, uh, the uh, cream of the crop of the time. It's the second largest city in the, in the, in the Roman uh, um, uh, Empire at the time. And so it was a cosmopolitan place and it was a cool place. And if you, anybody was anybody, lived in Corinth at the time. And, and uh, it was the height of fashion. It was the height of all kinds of different things. It was the Corinthian lifestyle. It was the coolest thing. Like if you wanted to be cool, you'd go to Corinth. And that was the cool thing. So he's writing to these people here. And Paul himself had ex- experienced extreme amounts of persecution, extreme amounts of brokenness in his own life. He came from a man who had once persecuted the church and destroyed it, to now he's a man who's actually leading the church and, and trying to grow it. And he writes to these people in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7. And he says this, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the surpassing greatness of the power of God will, will be of God and not of ourselves. He writes this thing and he says, we're a clay pot. I have one on a table over here. 
A clay pot is during a time where the, where the uh, lowest kind of pots that, that, that they ever created, they were common. They were made out of dirt of the earth. And, and a lot of scripture talks about this. He talks to uh, Adam and he says to Adam, from dirt you came from, from dirt you shall return one day. And, and we hear a lot about the, the potter and the clay all throughout scripture and Old Testament, New Testament. He talks about these things. And there were different types of pots that were created. Some were meant to be more fancy. Some were meant to just be plain. And the ones that were plain were just worthless and thrown out. They had no significance. If you go to uh, the area today and they do archaeological studies, they will find hundreds of these pots because there was no significance to them at all. Once they were done with them, they threw them away. In the book of Romans chapter 9, Paul writes and he talks about, doesn't the potter have the right to make uh, vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor? What he's talking about there is the, the nicer vessels they would take and they would paint and they would, they would make them more decorative. Those were things that food and other things were served on. And then he talks about vessels of, of dishonor. He's talking about once the food was digested, that would go into that pot and would actually be thrown away because they were just worthless. They were, they were, they were dishonorable. There was nothing honorable about them. And the words that Paul uses here, he says earthen vessels. He's talking about you and I. You and I are just like that pot right there. We're insignificant. There's not much to us. There's nothing great about us. We're the, we're the, we're the worst. We're disposable. We're throwaway. We're the lowest of everything. And so Paul right off the bat goes on. He puts us in our place and says, there's nothing really significant about us. When I was growing up, I idolized um, space stuff. And I've heard you guys have seen me do a message on, on space before. And I've got some pictures of the space shuttle here. And um, this is a, a cool picture. This is of uh, the space shuttle Atlantis. It's on its last flight, STS 335. It happened in July 2011. And it's the last flight that Atlantis or the space, uh, space shuttle program will ever be on. And uh, it's cool because uh, there it is. It's in outer space, uh, many, 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 many miles above Earth, and just doing its orbit and doing all its other things. And the island that you see there is actually the, one of the Bahama Islands there. And so it's just a cool image. But, you know, as, even as cool as, as this thing is, it has its limitations. The space shuttle is kind of lame. Um, let me show this next picture. It's kind of a, the cycle of, of the space shuttle. And uh, one of my good friends here, Mr. Larry Ladd, had the opportunity to work with NASA and rockets and other stuff. And I think it's one of the, the coolest things. But um, the space shuttle is just kind of lame. It, it don't do much. Um, here you see it, it's on this little crawler and this thing goes like a, a one mile per hour and they take it from its, where they build it and they put the rocket on it and then they take it over to its place to where it's going to launch and so it can't even crawl itself. So this next image we have here is it's about to take off and it can't fly itself. It has to have some external form to, to get it going, to get it moving. And actually goes up into space and it does its thing and, and there it is, it's taking off and it doesn't even power itself. It's, it's got a little bit of power but not enough to get it outside the Earth's atmosphere and so these rockets are firing this thing up into space. Then it does its thing in space and does whatever it does and it comes back to Earth and we have this next image. It's landing. It can't even, it can't even slow its own self down and so it has to have a parachute to slow, to help slow the thing down. It can't do much by itself. And then once they, you know, do whatever they do in, in California where it lands, they will fly it back across the United States to Florida where they redo the thing and it's got to take a ride on a 747. Here's the problem with this. Next time I have overage fees on baggage, when I go to the, to the Delta, I'm going to have some issues. I'm going to show them this picture. If you can fly a, a sh space shuttle on your back across the world, you can take my luggage. So here, here's the deal. The space shuttle is lame. It can't do much. It can't do much at all. It's got to have something to help it every step of the way. That's the way it's designed. That's the way it's purposed in life. But as, as lame as the space shuttle may be, what makes it cool is every time it goes into space, it has a purpose. And every time a potter makes one of those pots right there, there is a purpose to that pot. And every time that God makes a human being as lame as we are, there is a purpose to every one of our lives. I want to give you three spiritual truths this morning. Here's spiritual truth number one. God didn't create you to be a decoration. He created you to contain something valuable. This word treasure in verse 7, he says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. This word treasure is the Greek word thesaros. Thesaros is where we get the English word thesaurus. That's hard to say. Thesaurus, which is we have antonyms and synonyms and all these words as a treasure trove. But what happens a lot of times during the day, Paul used this because he knew people did this. 
they would take the common pots of the day, which people knew were not meant for anything, and they would place their thesauros inside of these pots. Because if a robber broke in, they're going to go find the most expensive looking, the most decorative pot, because they knew that's probably where you're going to hide your best stuff. But what people would do is they'd hide their treasure, their, their sorrows in a broke in a in a uh, just a common pot to fool robbers, and that's what Paul is talking about here. We have this this the thought the sorrows in this uh, earthen vessel. What is this the thought the sorrows that he's talking about? Verse six, God uh, the Bible says this: For God who said light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And so he's talking about this thing. He says this, this treasure that you have is the light of the knowledge of the glory of God that's placed inside of us. As God spoke physical light, physical creation into being in Genesis chapter 1, the same way that God has spoken spiritual light inside of your souls and has said, let there be light, and the light of Jesus Christ has come alive inside of us. And so he's talking about the gospel. What is the, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God? in the face of Christ. He's talking about the, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the gospel is this. A lot of us think it's just, I'm sinful and Jesus Christ died on the cross for me. That's just a part of the gospel. The gospel starts with, God is holy. I've sinned against him. God sent Jesus Christ to this earth to take the punishment of my sin so that I wouldn't have to. And then, not only that, he gives me the promise of the Holy Spirit to come live inside of me and the ministry of Christ inside of me so that every day of my life, I'm no longer hostile to God, but I'm a messenger for him. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's the treasure he's placed inside of each and every one of you who have knowledge of him this morning. That's a beautiful thing. He hasn't created you to be a, something pretty. He's created you to contain something valuable. I stole this illustration, so I'll go ahead and just give credit where credit is due. Let's just imagine for a second that you call Domino's and you call them up and you want your large pepperoni pizza and they're going to deliver it in 20 minutes. Well, 45 minutes later, they finally pull in. When they pull in, they run over some of your shrubs in your house and you're already kind of ticked anyways because your pizza's late and now you're running over the shrubs in your, in your yard. So the guy comes up and he's got this pizza in his hand, but it's not in a box. And so you enter the door, he knocks and you enter the door and there he is. And he's got your cheese hanging all over his hands. He's going to hand you this pizza and the cheese is just running all over his hands. And you look at him, and you're half disgusted at this point, and you're thinking, you're already late, you run over my shrubs, you about killed my dog out there, and you didn't talk to him. And so now you come up to me, and you're bringing this pizza, and the cheese is hanging off of your hands. Do you think I'm going to accept that pizza? No, the first question you're going to ask the guy is this, where's the box, dude? Where is the box? Where is the box at? Why, what's the big significance about the box? Well, the box is a container that the pizza goes in, and the, 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 the box does not give the pizza its significance, but the pizza gives the box its significance. So you accept the pizza as it is because it has a box. Why? Because it is, it's clean, and that's what pizza is supposed to come in. In the same way for your life, we're only a box. There's something very valuable and something very expensive and something that is invaluable actually comes in. And God says, I need you to be a box for me so I can place the treasure of the gospel inside of you so that people will accept it. Because when they look at you, man, when they look at you and they see that treasure inside, of them, they're going to want what's inside of there because they would never believe it any way else. I need you to be a clean, empty box that I can place my treasure inside of and do something great inside of. I need you to be a box. I need you to come before me clean. You know, the, the box does not give its value to the, to the product that's inside. The product inside gets its value to the box itself, and that's you this morning. You are worthless, you are disposable, a throwaway, but because you have the light of the knowledge of the glory of God inside of you, you have everything this morning. You have purpose, and you have life. You don't need to be fancy, you don't need to be decorative, you just need to be a container. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, sorry, 2 Kings chapter 4 there's a story in the Old Testament, and Elisha's the prophet, and uh, he has a friend who's actually a prophet, and, he, and his friend dies. So his wife calls him one day and says, uh, we have great debt that we owe. There's no way that we can take care of this debt, and they're coming to take my children off as slaves to pay off this debt. How can you help? And so Elisha, and kind of the common thing, says, let's walk through this thing. Let's, let's, let's talk through it. Let's see what happens here. And he says, what do you have in your house? It not only make things worse, she don't have anything or any way to come up with anything. She says, the only thing we have in our house is a little bit of oil. We don't have anything else, but that's it. We're, we're literally at the point of starvation. They're coming to take my children, they're taking them off. So Elisha says this, go find every pot that you can in the community that is clean and empty and bring them here. So she goes and does that. 
And so he says to them then, when you bring all the pots back, every pot that you can find, take every pot that you can find, send them out here and begin to pour out of the empty pot or the, the small pot that you have that's still in your house. Begin to fill these pots up. And when you have them filled up, go and sell those and that will take care of your, of your, of your problems. And so they begin to do that. They begin to pour and, and oil just continues to pour out of this pot. And so it fills this pot up, it fills this pot up, and it fills this pot up. And they fill every pot up they have until they run out of pots to fill up in life. Here's a great principle right here for our lives. God will fill you to the extent that you're empty. If there's something in your pot, if there's something clean in your pot, He cannot fill it up with, with His glory and His gospel this morning. You've got to be empty and you've got to come before Him. And to the extent that you prepare yourself to be filled with His glory, to the extent that He will do it. And so the principle here this morning is go find empty pots in your life. Uh, come before Him empty as a box, empty as a pot, empty as whatever you want to call it. Come before Him and say, I'm lame, I'm broken, I need you to fill me. He says, I will do that. Spiritual truth number two is this, we're all broken. We're all broken. You know, the, the reality is, and I think you know it, whether, whether we hide it or not, or we try to hide it, is that we're all broken human beings. I think it's in our nature of, of trying to hide that. And so we, we come across and um, we try to look better than we are. We try to protect our reputation in such a way so that people won't find out really who we are in life. Can I tell you something this morning, Grove people? Stop trying to hide it. You ain't got anybody fooled. We know from Scripture that you are a broken human being, so try to stop acting like you're not. Don't come in here and, and act like you've got all things together and like you've got it all figured out and, and life is all good for you and we know the truth that you are as broken as we are. Can I tell you something? There's an unwritten rule here, and that's this. There are no masks allowed in this place. I don't care what's going on in your life. If you come in with a mask on, this is probably not the right place for you. Why? Because we are a body of people that are broken, that are, that are trying to come together, trying to be vulnerable before our Lord Jesus Christ, trying not to hide off or chase off the Spirit of God, trying not to, to look at us and, and He think that we are proud of ourselves. We come before Him as, as exposed and all of our flaws out before Him, but confessing our sins at the same time, throw off our religion. Throw it off. Throw it off. That's a hard life to try to live across anyways, trying to be somebody that you're not, trying to be a fake. Half the time when deep down inside you know that you're a mess up anyways. It's never made sense to me. Come in here as you are. This place is a safe place. No matter what you've done in this community, as you come into this place, you need to know that you're safe. Listen, there's a lady, her name is Brene Brown. She's a sociologist and she does these TED Talks. And she says this, we are those people in quotation marks. That's the truth. Most of us are one paycheck, one divorce, one a drug addicted kid, one mental health diagnosis, one serious illness, one sexual assault, one drinking binge, binge one night of unprotected sex, uh, or one affair from being those people. Being the people, the ones that we don't trust, the ones that we don't pity, the ones that we don't let our kids play with, the ones that, make, that bad things happen to, the ones that we don't live, won't live in next to us. We are those people. Look around you this morning. Every one of us are those people. We are those people. We are those people. So we come together and we're all the same. It should be no surprise to you if tomorrow or the next time the paper comes out in Rome County News, one of the leaders of the church has been pulled over for a DUI. It should not surprise you. Why? Because we're all flesh and blood. It should not surprise you if you hear something about me this week. It shouldn't surprise you at all. Why? Because I'm a broken human being with a lot of tendencies to sin in a great amount of ways, probably greater than some of you. You probably just don't know it about me. You look at my DNA and my genes, boy, I've got it. I could, be, I could be one of the best. It's a natural thing. We try to hide it, though. We try to hide our brokenness just like Adam did before God in the garden. God had to come looking for him and ask, say, Adam, where are you? He says, I'm, I'm over here. I'm naked. I didn't want to come out before you because of my shame. We try to hide it. We try to hide it so much that we're the most medicated, most in-debt, most addicted society has ever lived on the face of the planet. Or brokenness in Scripture carries with it these adjectives. Shattered, crushed, maimed, 
devoid of arrogance, wounded, contrite, injured, smashed, grieved, distressed, crippled, wrecked, demolished, fractured, handicapped, and disabled. Those are the words that when we talk about being broken in Scripture that are attached to it, that come along with it. And that's what the Bible says, that only, our only way of coming to Christ is that way is through being shattered and crushed and maimed. This is the definition of it. It's a spiritual state by which one is disarmed of one's self-dependence and pride. Therefore, leaving one disabled and in desperate need of help, thereby, make, thereby making a viable conduit for Christ. The only way that Christ can ever fill you is if you come to Him and you're empty and broken. He can't fill a pot that is full. And God doesn't ask us for permission when He wants to do something inside of us. Oftentimes, God breaks us on purpose because He has a purpose for our life and He's trying to get us somewhere. But He doesn't ask us for a permission or a timeline of going down on, on Monday and sitting down. Well, on Wednesday, you're going to have a flat tire and it's going to be a terrible day. Well, no, let's not think Wednesday. Well, Thursday afternoon is going to be the best because I'm going to be at home and I can do it right there. No, God doesn't ask us. No, God doesn't ask us when cancer is going to come upon us. It just does. It happens. And Paul says the same thing right here in verse 8. He goes on. He says, we are afflicted in every way. We are, we are the, the idea of afflicted as it's you're being, you're being pressed upon. The same way that grapes, when they would put it in the, the contraption, they would squeeze out the grape juice so they could make wine. That's the same word that's used for afflicted here. And he says, in every way, in every single day, we are afflicted. We're pressed. We're, we're crushed. We've we're, 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 uh, got a lot of pressure on us every single day of life. This, I, this word afflicted is the same word that Jesus uses. He says, for the gate is small and the way is narrow. The way is afflicted that leads to life. But though we may be feeling the crushing pressure, pressure against us, the Bible goes on and says, but we are not crushed. I may be afflicted, but I'm not fully crushed here this morning. I may have my issues and I may have my thing that's going on, whether it's my fault or someone else's something that someone else done to me, but I'm not crushed this morning. He goes on and he says, we're perplexed but not despairing. This word perplexed is the idea of what we think. Is you're questioning. You've got to figure it out. You, you're, you're trying to figure stuff out. You're, you're maybe questioning God and asking Him, why? Why is this happening? Why is this going on in my life? He said, I may be questioning. I may not have my path laid out. I may be lost right now in this moment, but I'm not in despair. And the idea of despair is I haven't lost hope. I haven't lost hope in this moment because my faith is in Jesus Christ. He goes on and he says, the idea of I'm persecuted but not forsaken. This idea of persecution, we, we, we hear a lot about it nowadays because of what's happening all around our world to Christian believers. But it can be both external or internal. The idea of pers persecuted or being persecuted is experiencing hostility in order to drive us away from something. And so we can have external hostility. And thank God this morning that we can sit here without fear that it's going to happen inside of this building. But it can also happen internally because of our sin, because of our flesh that our pastor has been preaching. You know, our sin can be uh, persecuting us toward the being more broken than we should be, to, to losing hope, to, to being crushed, to, to falling out completely. Paul goes on verse 10, he says this, always caring about in our bodies the dying of Jesus. Always caring about in our bodies cancer. Always caring about divorce. Always caring about what they said to me in the past. Always caring about, our, caring about our reputation inside of this earthen vessel here. And can I tell you something? Satan never takes a day off from your life. Though you may get tired, you may get weary. Though you may feel the pressure coming around, you may feel persecuted, you may feel in distress, you may feel all these things. Satan never takes a day off just because you get tired. Paul goes on and says, even though Satan doesn't take a day off, even though I don't feel like it sometimes, even though I don't have it figured out, even though I don't, I don't understand a lot of things, we do not lose heart. Why do we not lose heart, Paul? Why do we not lose heart when cancers come upon me, when death is happening all around me, when I don't have life figured out and I don't have a direction that I'm going? I'm in all kinds of mess right now. I'm doing stuff that I shouldn't do. Why, Paul, should I not lose heart? Though our outer man is decaying and our inner man is being renewed day by day because of the glory and the gospel of Jesus Christ that's put inside of me. That's incredible. So Paul says, in my weakness, in my brokenness, in my pain, the life of Jesus is made known inside of me. He's placed the gospel inside of me so the, so the best thing that can happen to me is be vulnerable before other people so other people see that the surpassing power of the greatness is not of me, but it's of God. And so I spread it out and I say this, I'm always caring about my body, the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in my body. 
For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Paul says this in, first, uh, or in Philippians chapter 1. He talks about, um, he's actually in prison at this time. He's been in prison for almost five years. And he writes these books to the Philippians. It's the most joy-filled book that you'll ever read in your life. It doesn't make any sense at all. And he, he says things like this, Rejoice, again I say rejoice. And he talks about the suffering of Jesus Christ. And he talks about that his imprisonment in a Roman jail cell has been for the greater good of, of the world and for the gospel. Why? Because me being here has allowed the gospel to go forth because people have seen me in my distress and they see the joy that's inside of me and they want what I have. And he also goes on saying, because of my imprisonment, because of my suffering, because of my brokenness that I'm in right now, and they know my faults. I've been, set, I've been stuck here with them for two years. I've had days when I've been down, but even, even in my days I've been down, I've been filled full of joy. And other people, other churches have seen what's going on inside of me, and they've gained the courage that they need to continue to spread the gospel. And that's why I'm thankful that I'm here. Unbelievable. I'm going, that guys are going to turn down the lights right now. And, um... I have, a, I have an empty pot up here, um, just plain, um, nothing very exciting about it. We place our pots in it nowadays, but back in the day, they would have done some other things to it. Spiritual principle number three is this. Your brokenness reveals the glory of Jesus Christ. You come in here and you're all good. There's no glory of Christ in that. Why? Because you've done it on your own. What a lost world wants to see is someone who's genuine, someone that is um, maybe don't have it all figured out. But even in the midst of that, the glory of God of the gospel goes out. And so what happens is, is whether because of our own mess ups, our own fears, or something that like Paul talked about, because of our serving of the Lord Jesus Christ that happens to us, what happens in life is that we break. And the more broken we are, the light of the gospel comes out of us. It's God's purpose in your life is to take you, break you, and reveal the gospel of His Son, Jesus Christ. It's painful at times. Those of you who may have grown up in a church atmosphere where you couldn't have it all, you couldn't come in and, and you had to dress the part and had to look the part and act the part. Can I tell you something? It was a lie. Something our culture, our churches have taught your whole life, just like going outside with wet hair. Can I tell you something? Jesus says, they may have told you that, but I tell you, you've got to come in empty and broken. Not having it all figured out because I'm the answer to it. I will fill you full of the knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the face of Christ. So as you live life, the more broken you are, the more of you, more of me comes out of you. I'll make you a conduit for greatness. Paul says this, and our guys are going to come forward. 2 Corinthians 4.17, he says this, For this light and momentary affliction... Is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Paul realized the truth that God's brokenness in our life, he welcomed it. He welcomed imprisonment. He welcomed death. He welcomed anything anyone could ever say about him. He welcomed his past, his personality. Everything that he was, he welcomed it because he knew that anything that he experienced on this earth was creating for him something that was far greater on the other side once we take our last breath. And imagine that, an eternal weight of glory that he's creating for us. And I don't know about you this morning, but some of you need to be set free. Some of you need to be set free from the fact that, that you've got to have it all together. That you believe this lie your whole life or somebody's told you that you can't come in and look this way in this place. But you've got to have it all together when you walk into here. And you know, Jesus says, you come in here and I'm going to take care of whatever needs in your life. Whatever you have going on, what kind of brokenness is going on in your life, that's the person I'm going to make the conduit of my glory. I want to use you 
in a powerful way. So this morning, there's two different things here, I guess. One is, is for someone who thinks they have it all together. Maybe you're going through life. Maybe you don't know Jesus Christ. And you come before him. And, 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 and I want to say to you that Jesus will welcome you right here in this place. He's not expecting anything from you other than your brokenness before him. Of your just giving of yourself like this woman and saying, Jesus, this is all I have. I give it to you. You know, this woman, this is the last thing I'll, I'll say, and I'll be done. This woman poured out perfume that she had around her neck. This perfume was the, the essence of her livelihood. One drop at a time, one man at a time, she poured it out uh, to, to anyone who, who asked of her. But before Jesus, she broke the whole jar and poured it out. No game plan. Didn't know where she was going to go next. Didn't have a, a, a plan of how she was going to take care of herself after this. But she went in the knowledge and the hope and the faith of Jesus Christ that He would take care of her. You may be here this morning caught up in all your sin and struggles. Just like this woman, He asked you to pour it out before Him. You may not have a game plan of where you're going after this, but He does for your life. He knows the direction for, for your life that He wants for you. Maybe you're tired this morning of playing the game. Maybe the straps holding the mask on are a little tight this morning and Jesus offers to you forgiveness. He offers you the ability to come before Him raw and uninhibited. Your shame and disgust maybe. Say, this is who I am. This is who I've been. God, if you would accept me, I want to come home. Head bowed.